Thank you, Vishika. I think that uh, you can see my slide. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, good. Before I start, let me congratulate uh, Gubba group of companies and as Karan mentioned, I think that they have made really big uh, achievements for the seed industry, for Indian agriculture. So we would like to congratulate you, Karan Vai, for all your hard work and your vision basically. And now this is really good that you are having engagement of more than 500 seed companies, which is very, very much required. And also would like to congratulate NSAI, Dr. Trivedi, that they are really doing good work. And I think seed is very important. And that's the reason that even in this presentation, I'm talking about that, how we can develop better seed. So seed is the important vehicle for tra translating, transferring the technology from lab to field. And I think for doing these things, and if we would like to help smallholder farmers, agriculture in any country, it's really required that we need to work together for that. Either this is public sector, private sector, and seed industry, and the different starts of such etc. And I feel very happy that when in India, all these things are really coming up very nicely. So my best wishes, my congratulations to Gubba as well as NSAI. Thank you very much, Karan and uh, Ishika and Dr. Trivedi for inviting me here. And here in this presentation, I will give some of our work or share some of our work, which mainly has been done at Ecreset and our collaborating partners. Many of you may be knowing that I have moved down to Murdoch University because I believe that science or scientists do not have the boundaries to contribute from one country to other country. And science is something that when you do something, you have the international public goods and they can be translated from one country to other country. We need to have the resources, we need to have the technology. And from this perspective, I find that Australia here in the Murdoch University, this is a really fantastic place. So I think that from the Murdoch University, this is my first public uh, webinar or lecture. So I feel also very excited and honored. And uh, yes, so what I'm going to do that in this presentation, I will share some of our ideas and views. Though I will give the example of some crops, but basically these examples of these technologies, they are applicable to any, any crop or so. Now let's see from the public sector perspective that why we are so much keen about agriculture. We all know that agriculture in all over the world and more specifically in developing countries is facing lots of global challenges. Climate change is one of them. Land degrade is another one. And there are many other things, but one of the key things are why we do this thing, because we are having continuous population growth. And I will not go into the details, but we all know that if we need to feed 10 million people by 2050, we need to produce 74% more food. And from where we can bring, this will come only from the agriculture and then from the, and especially in the developing countries where that agriculture is done by smallholder farmer, then this becomes much more challenging. And this is the region that we need to bring these different players together as Karan mentioned and uh, Dr. Trivedi mentioned and other people mentioned. So I think that this is really important. Now, how we can do it? And I think this is good that the Gubba, they are having this now in inauguration of this biotechnology lab. And I think that many of you will be visiting this thing as well. So, but before that, I'd like to take you one step back. I think during last hundred years, since after this Mendel's rediscovery or so, or maybe that start of the 19th century, so we, 20th century, so then we started to have that uh, crop improvement program and uh, this crop breeding related thing. And what crop improvement, mainly the crop breeding, but allied disciplines, including physiology, entomology, and uh, pathology, many other disciplines, they're working together. And what we have been doing that they have been developing the varieties high quality seeds through integrating or improving the disease resistance, enhancing the crop productivity or pest resistance, developing the varieties which are environmental stress tolerant, having the high nutrition sustainability. This is going fine, not fine, but I mean that they have been doing great work. But I think that we need to enhance the space further. And during the last 10, 20 years, there are lots of advances in the technologies and they have been very, very helpful to improve agriculture. And I will highlight some of these things. And I think among different biotech innovations, all the different technologies are important, but I'm not saying that this is more important or the other important. But what I would like to mention that I think in recent advances, and this in the genomics area, where 
you can sequence the genome of any crop you can understand the genes the basis of any trait very easily but until recently this has been restricted to many advanced research institute or higher or big industry so i think that what we need to do now this is the time that we need to have the democratization of the sequencing technology and now once we have this sequencing technology you can use that population germplasm from the different uh, gene bank or breeding program you can do the sequencing genotyping phenotyping we need to do multi-location phenotyping and this is really good that Kuba also is in, in this process of multi-location phenotyping of that elite materials but here i'm talking about more the discovery component and once we have this sequencing genotyping phenotyping etc nowadays we can develop the pen genomics we can do the high density genome wide association studies we can identify genes or markers associated with the trait and we can use them in breeding prompts so i think this is that now they nowadays the framework that we need to move on and to address this thing and i would like to highlight that we have used these kind of technology or so in several crops but here in this presentation i will highlight examples mainly in the chickpea pigeon pea and groundnut in india there are many many important crops including wheat rice beige etc but here i'm highlighting these things because these are the crops that are grown in the marginal land by small older farmers and the crop productivity has not been very high unfortunately because of number of reasons there is not much investment there is not much excitement or interest from the private sector etc so but nevertheless what we have been doing that together with partners we have been working on these crops so i would like to highlight some of these things now let's start the 12 what kind of innovation because the topic of my talk is about the genomics and breeding innovation when we talk about the genomics then basically we are talking the genome and the genome sequence etc and then why we need to do that we need to have the repertoire of entire set of the genes <coughs> for a given crop and we do that one and i think that uh, late uh, last year there were several journals of nature they came together and they were discussing that what kind of impact genome sequencing has made I happened to one of those advisors from the crop science perspective and then in this issue they have discussed the sequencing technology they have not just helped medical or human genetics and livestock improvement etc but plant or crop improvement also a lot and how we can do it i will i like to give some example <coughs> when you want to do some work and would like to use the modern technology as i said you need to have the genome sequence in your head as I said earlier, majority of time the genome sequences were coming from the Advanced Research Institute, very expensive technology, etc. But we have demonstrated while working in India that one can deliver, one can lead genome sequencing efforts, not in one crop, two crop, three crop. We have demonstrated this thing more than 10 crops through our former, where I used to work earlier. Now I will say former, former center of excellence. Well, my former organization or my former center center of excellence in genomics and systems biology and we have developed decoded the genome of pigeon pea way back in 2012 even the sequencing technology they were not very advanced at that time point the illumina sequencing technology this was having just 36 base per reads similar kind of work we did in the case of chickpea pulmonet two genomes of peanut or tetraploid groundnut uh, and two different genomes and also the tetraploid groundnut and not only that one many other tropical crops including sesame, moovin, ajukivin, jatropa, pea in some of these things we are having really good collaboration from many partners from China, Korea, Asia, India etc. So what I want to tell that we have delivered that decoded the genomes for more than 10 crops and this is a big thing, I think, for that uh, so-called orphan crops where we did not have the resources, we developed the resources. Genome sequence is one of them, but while doing this thing, we have developed large-scale resources, including gene expression at plus, etc. But I will come back later. Now, one more thing, because there are always technological innovations, and we keep we need to keep on embracing the new technology. So initially, when we have these genome assemblies, at that time point, they were the best one. But now we have the new technology called HiC or 3D genome sequencing technology and we have used this technology and we have improved our reference genome of pigeon pea, chickpea, etc. And then by using this technology, we have shown that, well, if you use the modern technology, you can 
have the chromosome length uh, genome assemblage, etc. So I think this is the way that we can keep on moving. And uh, so this is one. Second is that once you understand the reference genome, that's great. But now you need to understand the genetic variation. When you do the plant breeding, then creation and utilization, creation, assessment, and utilization of genetic variation is very much important. For plant breeding applications, what we did that we sequenced 300 pigeon pea lines. They were coming from the different parts of the world. We also did the phenotyping. And by combining these phenotyping and sequencing data, we identified many genes or markers associated with the different traits. We did similar kind of work in the case of chickpea, where we sequenced more than 430 lines, we have evaluated this thing for yield, for agronomic traits, especially related to the climate change, yield under drought and heat stress, etc. And one of the key thing was that this was last year that we have not just sequenced few hundreds, we sequenced at 3,366 genomes. This was the largest plant genome sequencing project so far in any crop or so. And then this was highlighted not only the science, but in the general public media, at least 60 different media houses, they published this thing, including New York Times, The Economist, and many other journals or so. And I felt very happy and excited, including that cover page interview in the Biotech Express, etc. So I think that what I want to tell that these kind of world work, when you are not reaching just to the scientific community, but even creating the public awareness, this is very important and this, then society, policy makers, they can appreciate the value of this upstream science that how this can be used in the crop improvement, etc. In summary, what this sequencing project provided, this has provided a lot of stuff, but in key, this provided the genetic variations in the cultivated genome, wild species genome in chickpea, you may be knowing about desi, kabli, etc. And on, I will talk one thing that uh, rather two in this one from this project. One is the pan genome. What is pan genome? If you sequence only one individual, you will be able to target the genes of only that individual. But if some disease resistant genes or drought tolerant genes, they are not present in that individual, you may miss it, right? Therefore, we need to have the pan genome. Pan genome means for a given species, you need to sequence larger number of individuals. You need to compile, you need to have the reporter of the entire species or so. And that's what we did in the case of chickpea. So for instance, our reference genome sequencing project that had only 28,000 genes, but when we did this pen genome, this has identified 1,600 more genes out of that 1,582. They were potentially novel genes and they're related to many interesting traits. So I think this is really important. The other thing is that we, we have some archaeological evidences where chickpea was originated, how did it migrate, etc. But based on the DNA, we have identified, established the center of origin of chickpea in the fertile crescent. We also have established the fact that how this moved into the different parts of the world and our study analyzer say that this happened in two ways. That one is this one path moved or chickpea moved from to the South Asia and East Africa. Second one moved to the Mediterranean region and also to the Black Sea and Central Asia through Afghanistan and then this was entered even in India. So the chickpea which was coming through Afghanistan or so, that was the black one or gold seeded, this started to be called Kabli chickpea because this was coming to that here. And after that, then this started to migrate to the new world or so different parts of the thing. Even based on this thing, you can understand the species divergence that how the species divergence happened between these different species. So these are some basic analysis for the genome evolution, biology, etc. But thing is related to the breeding, related to that, how you can develop the better variety seed. What happens when people talk about the biotechnological innovations or even the breeding or marker assisted selection? They always try to keep on accumulating the good genes, the good alleles for the different traits. This is in our study identified that or we have given the concept also of the deleterious alleles, the genetic loads and shown this thing that in any crop and there were some studies in some other crops also available like cassava or so, but now not many. But then our study has shown that even you talk any crop species, elite varieties, they're the good genes, but they are also carrying the deleterious effect alleles. This is called genetic load. And we have given the concept that in the case, if you would like to enhance the yield, if you would like to have high quality seeds, high yielding variety, high yielding variety seeds, 
not only you talk about the accumulation of the good alleles, but also you can take care of reducing or purging the deleterious allele. And nowadays you got the approaches through genomic suggested breeding or through gene editing. So I think that this is new way to do the things. So we have done this genetic analysis as well. And we gave this, so basically we did a lot of genomics work. Now, and I'm not going in the other areas, but now because my objective of this talk is to demonstrate that how you can use these technologies in developing high quality, high yielding seeds. After genomics, now you need to understand the genetics of the traits in which we are interested. So for instance, yield or disease resistance or anything. For that, we need to have the cost-effective genotyping platform. If you would like to have the breeding program utilizing these genomics tools, you need to have the cost-effective genotyping platform. For that, we have developed markers, a range of the marker genotyping platform starting from SSR, DART, GBS, CASPER, 56,000 SNP arrays, whole genome sequencing, 10 SNP panel, 2,000 SNP array. And these, you can ask the question, why so many panels? Because if you would like to do the genome analysis at the deeper level, then whole genome resequencing is required. If you would like to do the GWAS analysis, probably 56,000 SNP array. If you would like to have the biparental population mapping, maybe GBS or 2,000 SNP array will be good. Or if you would like to do the marker assisted selection for few genes for the forward breeding, the forward mark, foreground selection, 10 SNP panel will be very cost effective. If you would like to go to the background selection, or the genomic selection, you can even do the work with the 2000 SNPs or DART markers, etc. So I think depending on the objective, you can utilize these technologies. So this is one that you can sequence, you can genotype these different populations. Now, the next thing is we need to undertake the phenotyping. Phenotyping can be in the field with multi-location phenotyping, etc. This is great. We need to think like that. But nowadays, there are also lots of advances where you can use aerial phenotyping platforms you can use the ground phenotyping platforms and these thing platforms can be used to undertake large density phenotyping etc even at uh, icris at my former place we used to have different kind of extensive phenotyping platform including the drought tolerance for lazy skin lysimeter field and i think last year we also have undertaken this phenotyping at the next level where we have including the drones and by using flying these drones on the plot level, etc., and then we can do the yield assessment, etc., of the different plots or different trials. So I think this is another thing. So anyway, so now once you got the genome data, phenotyping data, we put these things together and we use the approaches like linkage and association mapping. And then we are not going the details, but by doing these analysis, you can identify genes or markers associated with the trait. And then we have mapped. By using these kind of things, we have mapped 20 to 50 traits in chickpea, groundnut, and pigeon pea. And I will show that uh, how we can use. So I think that this was, uh, this is the second component of my presentation. First was genomics technology. Second is how you use the genomics technology to understand the genetics of the trait. So this is the trait map. Now, third component is translational research. How? You can do this thing in the breeding program, either the public sector or private sector breeding program, which is key that how we can integrate these innovations. In this regard, as I said, so once we identify genes, we need to take them to, to the field. And for that, we have a range of that technology or approaches, genomics assisted breeding, including marker assisted back crossing, marker assisted recurrent selection, genomic selection approaches, etc. And I would like to highlight, in fact, B gives a concept of the genomics assisted breeding way back in 2005 and i think under genomics assisted breeding you can put several approaches together markers selection, markers by crossing markers recurrent selection and then we also have given another concept of that genomics assisted breeding 2.0 because the general trends in plant science asked after 15 years that how this technology evolved and we say that gab 2.0 will have the haplotype based breeding approach, genomic selection approach, and in the, the genomic selection also optimal contribution selection. Third is the gene editing. And we say that for breeding, you need to have the gene editing for both purpose. One is promotion of the good alleles. Second is removal of the bad alleles. So you can call them page or race or like promotion of alleles through the gene editing, removal of alleles through the gene editing. 
And nowadays you might have heard a lot about the speed breeding. If you combine these speed breeding with any of these technology, you can really speed up the progress in development of the variety just so. By using the first set of the genomic assisted breeding, again by using the genomics or so and decrease set and our partners, we developed the first set of the high oil groundnut varieties. What happens in the oil, groundnut oil, if you see, you are having palmitic acid, linoleic acid and oleic acid. So basically linoleic acid is not good for health because this is the polysaturated fatty acids. Some varieties from United States or so are having more than 90% oleic acid, which is good for health. What we did that we're using this genomic assisted breeding, we have changed the varieties and you can see in many of these lines now, more than 80 to 90% of the oleic acid. And these varieties out of these things too, Grenar 4 and Grenar 5, they were released in 2020. And those two varieties, they were also dedicated to the nationwide Honorable Prime Minister Modi. Now, not only that one, we have used this approach in chickpea. And generally, so far in many other crops, when you use the biotech approaches, people are trying to do these things, disease resistance, which is relatively better trade. But in the case of chickpea, we have demonstrated that even for drought tolerance, we have developed these varieties. And this variety, Gele2, was released in Ethiopia. Pusa chickpea 10216 was released in India. This was in collaboration with the Pune Institute of Agriculture Research. This is with IRI, with Dr. Bhardwaj. And then some fusion wilt resistance, which is a disease thing and now by using these approaches we are also successful to deliver fusion wind traditional variety in collaboration with US Raichur and also in IRI New Delhi and not only that one even the 2021 there were three other varieties drought tolerant and fusion wind they came through the collaboration of IRI, IITR etc. Even the 2021 Honorable Prime Minister Modi when he was dedicating 35 varieties to the nation then Two of these varieties, they were also part of the set. So I think that this is the thing. Same thing in the case of pigeon pea, we have demonstrated this thing that you can use these technology to deliver the better varieties. So I think I was trying to demonstrate that when you use these concerted efforts from the genomics technology, you can deliver the results even in so-called orphan crops, including chickpea, groundnut, and pigeon pea. Now, the next thing is that where, from where, from here, where we would like to go. And we have given the concept of the fast forward breeding framework. And in this fast forward breeding framework, we say that we do not need to talk just genes. Now we need to go one step further. And in one of the approach called haplotype based breeding. So we need to identify the genetic variants of the different genes. And then we need to identify the good haplotypes and we need to put this thing in the breeding program. Similarly, the genomic prediction, when you are having the population, instead of screening those population with one or two genes, we need to do the whole genome profiling and we need to predict the yield based on this whole genome profile. And then there will be another approach called optimal contribution selection. And here in this approach, that how we can use the land races of the gene bank material without the sacrificing the yield. So we need to have a really good combination of the parents and we use this optimal contribution selection. The other approach is the genome editing, which is a very popular approach. And as I told that you need to combine these things with the speed breeding, then you can develop the better varieties, high yielding varieties. And we already started to do this work. Now, for instance, this is the haplotype when you are having the sequencing data for a large number of genotypes. Here you have the genes, you identify the different haplotypes, and then you link or do the haplophenol analysis do the comparison or analysis of these different haplotypes and phenotypes and try to identify the good haplotypes. So for instance, in the gene 1, H3 haplotype is best one, gene 2, superior haplotype is H1, gene 3, haplotype H3 is the best one. Then we ask a question, in the elite varieties, which haplotypes are missing the good haplotypes? And if we find, oh, for gene 1, this is having the H2 haplotypes, on the other hand, the best haplotype is H3. Same thing for the gene 3, you got the haplotypes H4, but then we need to have for gene 3, the best haplotypes is H2. So then we need to use these haplotype approaches and we call it haplotype based breeding. In fact, in the case of chickpea, again, what we did that you remember I was talking about 3000 chickpea lines. And this was the project which Dr. Trivedi also mentioned when he was the, with the Ministry of Agriculture. And thank you very much, Dr. Trivedi, Dr. Ashish Bahuguna sir and many other people. So then we started some project 
And when we did this chickpea analysis, so sequencing of 3000 chickpeas, also phenotyping at six different locations for two different years, we put all these data together and we, after that, we try to identify the haplotypes. And based on these haplotypes, we have identified that, well, you are having, and we did the haplotype phenotyping analysis, we identified about that 56 promising lines that are having the better superior haplotypes in the case of chickpea. And recently, when Honorable Prime Minister Modi, when he was digitally said, we were very excited to see in the chickpea field and tested some of those lines which we have delivered or identified through introgressing or through identification of those haplotypes. So, so I think that these are really very exciting approaches that you can have these kind of haplotypes. And now this is the time that we need to use these haplotypes in the breeding program. The next approach is the genomic breeding. And here we use the optimal contribution selections. So how you need to identify the parent lines. And I think that for these things, we need to have the simulation approach, prediction approaches. Similarly, we can use a different kind of genomic prediction models. And we have been working on the different type of that genomic prediction, including that machine learning and artificial intelligence based approaches, HOGEM approaches based on the breeding values, based on the haplotypes and different things. And our idea, our strategy indicate that when you have these sequencing phenotyping data, you can identify the new parental combinations. And we are having this, some idea that you can enhance the yield up to 23% on that what we have right now. How we are moving ahead? So in the case of legumes at Equiset, when I was there with my colleagues or so, we have initiated several of these programs. In the case of chickpea, for instance, we have done the first round of these haplotype, uh, sorry, genomic predictions. Same thing in the case of groundnut. And in the case of pigeon pea, based on these things, we have identified that uh, we have established the fact that we can use these genomic prediction. And I think for the discovery, this is really important work where that Indian seed industry, Indian public sector breeding program, they need to come up. They need to work with this different and concerted efforts with the startup companies, etc. that how we can take this material, the phenotyping, genotyping, data analysis. I think data analytical thing is very, very important in the current scenario. So we need to move ahead. Now, the last thing which I would like to tell, so this was about that fast forward breeding that how you can develop the better varieties. Now, the next thing is that many researchers, they forget about the delivery system where seed industry and many other stakeholders, they play a very important role in the developing countries. When you have the elite varieties, seed system is not very strong, so they are not reaching to the farmers. But thanks to the seed industry, especially in India, where we got these small medium and seed companies or so, and they are really doing a great work that but because of their effort, the seed is reaching to the smallholder farmers. Now, what we believe that these seed system, seed delivery system needs to be strengthened in any country, either bring in the public sector or private sector, but this needs to be strengthened. And farmers need to have the varieties replaced after every three to five years. We should not have in the farmers field the older varieties. India has done a great job by replacing 20 to 30 years, they brought this time to about now eight to 10 years in many crops in many states or so. Now, the next thing is that when you are having these seeds reaching to the farmers, then farmers need to be provided the decision support tools through their mobile technology, etc. They need to be told that, well, when they need to do the seed sowing, when they need to do the spraying, when they need to do the irrigation, so I think farmers need to be well equipped with this better agronomy. If you are providing just better seeds, not agronomy, you cannot harvest that better yield. Then many times we are also having the reduction is the post harvest losses, etc. We are having a lot of other thing. And I think that's what the Gubba has been doing, not only the side, but I think that if you are having the enough amount of the cold storage or so, you can really reduce this kind of thing as well. But anyway, the next thing is that when farmers are having the seeds of these produce in the field, they need to be connected to the markets. This is also a very important thing so that these profits also reach to the farmers. We also need to think that how we can do the value addition, we can have the processing so that we are not just talking the benefiting the farmers, even the consumers, they may also be beneficial. And we have given this concept of the rapid delivery system recently in this nature biotechnology. We have done similar kind of work in many other areas, and I would like to highlight this particular flagship project from the Gates Foundation led by ICRISAT in collaboration with CIAT, IATA, other CGR Institute with the 15 
different countries, 13 countries in Africa, two countries in Asia, India and Bangladesh. And I happened to be the PI of this project for about seven years. And this project was in the different phases, $67 million investment for six different crops, 15 different countries. So this is a huge investment. But now by using the traditional or molecular breeding approaches, etc., this project facilitated to develop 266 improved varieties 497,000 certified 6, 6.1 million ton grains. And we have documented this knowledge in the different journals and books. But one of the key important thing is that we were working with the private sector in that part of the world. And we wanted to have the functional seed delivery platform so that even when project goes out, then how this seed delivery platform, or they can continue to work with that farming community and the farmers are having continuous delivery of the seeds. This project made a lot of impact and for this impact of this project, ICWI said my former institute got that Africa food prize in 2021. So we feel very excited, very happy about that one that well, our work has been recognized at all the places. Friends, I want to summarize my presentation by saying that as I showed in this presentation, I was giving the three different parts in the initial thing, genomics, genetics and breeding, which are the key for accelerating crop improvement. Then I moved the new framework about the fast forward breeding where we talked about the haplotype based breeding we talked about the genomic selection ocs also the gene editing then i was talking from the public sector perspective that rapid delivery system is very very much required and this is really required and that i think that seed industry this can play very very important role so nsai and gubba they are having really important role to play they are already working in this direction Next is the farmer's access to the better markets, value addition, food and processing, and this will generate more income to the farmers and deliver better products to the consumer. Lastly, in my opinion, international agriculture agencies they need to continue to train and develop the next generation of crop scientists, empower farming communities by implementing farmer-centric agricultural policies. And I think, as I said earlier also, international, national and local government agency support is really required when we are talking about addressing the global challenges. And with these things, I think I removed my thanking slide, but I think that thanks to all the partners from ICRISAT and collaborators all over the world, and we are really very excited. I'm thankful to all my colleagues and collaborators. Thanks for all their efforts.